One event changed Hitler and therefore the course of World War II. In July 1944, after a series of unsuccessful attempts, a group of conspirators in the German army managed to place a bomb in close proximity to Hitler in the hope of assassinating him. Although I've already covered the whole saga of the German military resistance to Hitler and the bomb plot in great detail in a series of videos on both of my channels, see end screen for links, to quickly summarise what occurred would be a useful refresher for those unfamiliar with the topic. Going all the way back to the late 1930s, a group of largely aristocratic and conservative army officers and civilians had been trying to remove Hitler from power. They generally agreed that Hitler would have led Germany to ruination and were disgusted by his increasingly homicidal policies towards the Jews. But actually killing Hitler had been a hard step for these men to take, as it would involve them breaking their sacred oath of loyalty to the Führer, a serious thing to do when oaths were held in the highest regard by honourable men of the officer class. After the German defeat at Stalingrad in early 1943, it was clear that Germany was going to lose the war in the long run, so this galvanised the resistance into direct action. The plan was to kill Hitler and replace the Nazi government with a military-led government of anti-Nazi generals and colonels, make peace with the Western Allies and continue the war against the Soviets to save Germany from occupation and destruction. Eventually some form of democratic government would be introduced. But Hitler had the luck of the devil and all attempts to kill him failed. Eventually, on the 20th of July 1944, a staff officer, Colonel Count von Stauffenberg, a resistance leader, managed to plant a bomb in a conference hut at Hitler's Eastern Front headquarters, the Wolf's Lair in East Prussia. The bomb detonated, devastating the room and killing or injuring many of the officers of the conference. Stauffenberg left the room shortly before the detonation and, believing Hitler was dead, hastened by plane to Berlin to enact a coup and replace the government. Hitler, however, though lightly wounded, survived, and over the next few hours the plot unravelled as Hitler reasserted control. Stauffenberg and the core plotters were arrested and summarily shot at army headquarters in Berlin, and then a wave of terror unleashed by a vengeful Hitler on anyone suspected of complicity in the plot. Thousands were arrested and hundreds executed. The affair frightened the army, killed off the resistance, and actually strengthened Hitler's control over the military, and also elevated the status of the SS as the most loyal organisation of the state. Hitler attributed his miraculous survival, as he had been standing only feet away from the briefcase when the bomb exploded, to divine intervention, proof that his mission was not yet complete. It gave him new impetus and purpose, and he saw to it that the event was commemorated with a very special medal, a medal so rare that real ones are truly worth a small fortune, the 20th of July Wound Badge. A system for recognising wounds caused by enemy action had existed in the German military since 1918, when Emperor Wilhelm II had approved the creation of a wound badge that a soldier would wear on his left breast pocket. The award had the same purpose as the American Purple Heart, a medal issued to US personnel for war wounds. Hitler had received the wound badge in black in 1918, following his gassing during a British mustard gas attack on the Western Front, and he wore this decoration proudly beneath his Iron Cross First Class, earned for battlefield bravery in World War I. The badge was very simple in design. A German steel helmet in profile set in an oval, with cross swords passing behind it. In World War II, three levels of wound badge existed, the World War II medal being slightly altered to incorporate a swastika on the side of the helmet. The lowest class was the wound badge in black, awarded for one or two wounds, then the wound badge in silver for three or four wounds, and finally the wound badge in gold for five or more wounds. Interestingly, on the 1st of June 1940, Hitler decreed that any serviceman who received the wound badge in silver or gold would automatically also receive the Iron Cross second class. Only the higher class earned was worn on the uniform. However, a very serious wound, such as loss of a limb or loss of sight, would see a soldier immediately receiving the silver badge. The badges, made by 24 approved manufacturers, were of pressed steel, brass and zinc, the gold badge being gilded. 
Hitler decided to decorate the victims of Count von Stauffenberg's bomb with a special edition wound badge. Twenty-four officers had been in the conference hut when the bomb exploded, and four were killed or died of their wounds shortly afterwards. The 20th of July wound badge came in black, silver and gold versions. Depending on the class of ordinary wound badge the officer already held, and the number and severity of the wounds received in the 20th of July bombing. The badges, all of solid silver, were slightly different from the regular versions. The helmet, slightly larger and set higher, with the date of the attack and Hitler's facsimile signature below. On the 20th of August 1944 a ceremony was held, and the first of the new badges presented by the Führer, and the posthumous awards to the four dead men also presented to their wives. The 25th man present on the 20th of July 1944 did not receive this badge, that man being Adolf Hitler. He refused the award and continued to wear his World War I wound badge in black. The rest of the officers were decorated in a second awards ceremony on the 2nd of September 1944. More than 24 of these wound badges were actually awarded as some officers were wounded again later in the war. For example, Hitler's naval adjutant, Vice Admiral Erich Foss, earned all three grades of this unique award. He received the badge in black in August 1944 for the bombing, and was upgraded twice to the gold version for subsequent war wounds. The firm of C.E. Juncker manufactured a total of 100 of these rare badges in three grades, each badge coming in a black box with a white silk interior. Records show that a total of 30 of these badges were issued, 16 in black, 7 in silver and 7 in gold, indicating, as I mentioned, that some men were wounded again later and advanced another grade. So where are these badges today? The Imperial War Museum in London owns a black example, and in 2003 a silver grade badge was auctioned at Bonhams in London, with an opening bid of £8,000. The National World War II Museum in New Orleans has a silver grade badge from the ruined Reich Chancellery in 1945, found under rubble in the corner of Hitler's office. These three examples are of course quite genuine, with good provenances. Fakes are of course numerous, and a 20th of July wound badge with traceable provenance to one of the 24 men who originally received them would be worth $50,000 or more. Large numbers of these wound badges remain undiscovered and uncatalogued, and some people are sitting on fortunes today, perhaps not realising what their GI grandfather brought back from the war, or in private hands in Germany or Russia. But these things come with a very big buyer beware warning, as reproductions can be virtually indistinguishable from the originals. As with most things, documentary provenance is essential. The pool of badges is further muddied by the fact that in addition to the original run of 100 badges made in 1944, the firm of Juncker made a second run of a few dozen, with a different serial number, but probably for the purpose of private purchase by the original recipients who wanted more than one badge for different uniforms, to avoid the inconvenience of having to move the badge every time they change tunic. So now you know what to look for. I suggest you take another look at Grandpa's wartime bringbacks. You never know what you may discover. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share. And also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.